our guest today is Dr. Matthew Raphael Johnson. And, of course, most of our listeners uh, remember Dr. Johnson. He was on the program just a few weeks ago, and, of course, he was also our guest on what was our highest-rated program of last year. And, among other things, besides uh, being an academic and a college professor and a member of the Contributing Board of Editors at the Barnes Review magazine, he is also a priest in the Russian Orthodox Church, which gives him a tremendous amount of knowledge and authority to speak to the things that we're going to discuss today. And that is the persecution and the martyrdom of millions of Russian Orthodox during the Soviet era. So, uh, Dr. Johnson, welcome to the program. Well, thanks for having me. I hope your uh, listeners don't get sick of me. <laughs> but uh, this is this is a topic that's, you know, very emotional. Um, my bishop, uh, Metropolitan Damaskin of Moscow, uh, was one of the catacomb priests many years ago. He... Um, was in prison for some time there because he was a steel worker in the Urals in the 70s. And he started a riot um, because, you know, organized labor was, was illegal, which shouldn't surprise anybody as far as the Soviet Union goes. And he tried to form a union there um, and got a bit too heavy on the anti-communism and uh, uh, was, was arrested and, and sent to a gulag for a while, then sent to a you know, normal prison after that. So... Um, um, I, I speak to him on a pretty regular basis, and uh, we have a few people now in, 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 that have emigrated to this country who know the, the gulag system pretty well. We have an abbot here, was, was treated so badly, and he's so paranoid, he doesn't allow me to say his name, because he still fears that someone's going to come and get him. I can't even say where he lives or his name, uh, because he's asked me to, to, to do that, and he, they did something to him. He's a good man, he's a good priest and everything else. But they did something to him such that he, he lives in perpetual terror. The first one to go was his grandmother. And then uh, his parents were atheists, but he was raised by his, by his grandmother, and, and that's, what, that's what changed everything. And he came to America in, um, I want to say, the early 80s. You know, he's been struggling with this ever since. So uh, he's my immediate superior. And he actually, again, was one of these, one of these catacomb guys. And, and one of the problems that really no one has talked about yet is the mental problems that some of these people have. Because, like in the case of Romania, for example, they experimented on these guys. Um, the book is called uh, The Antihumans. The Antihumans was about the experiments that they engaged in in Romania to remove the part of the brain that had faith in God. This is something that Khrushchev actually believed in. And the experiments essentially were to associate Christian things with the most horrible things imaginable. They would hear, like, the Lord's Prayer while being covered in feces or having homosexual acts performed on them while, you know, hearing a chant or something like that. And it was a tactic. The point was to destroy the love of the church by traumatizing them as they're hearing some sacred thing, because these guys were really creative on what they came up with. It failed miserably. And on the other hand, Khrushchev was really, really, uh, of all the, other than Trotsky, Khrushchev was really the big crusader against the church, and he really believed that you could remove a part of the brain, that this was actually a physical part of the brain, that religious faith, and that if you remove that, you'll be an atheist. And now that was never done, but they tried to develop all kinds of drugs and chemicals that would shut that part of the brain down. And they had this gulag population to experiment on. And needless to say, I mean, I, I don't, the things that happened, and the, the records were pretty pretty meticulous. And the tremendous chemical research that was done on these guys with that in mind, it, it didn't survive Khrushchev. It failed very badly. Uh, when detente developed uh, near the end of his rule and really the beginning of Brezhnev, they stopped a lot of this. Now it's an error. You'll, see, you'll hear it, most historians think that the gulags were dismantled when Stalin died. It's a, it's a trick, it's very common. The Soviet Union was okay except for the Stalinist era. The Soviet experiment, part of the concept is, is that this, this was always the case. Every one of these guys uh, who ruled the Soviet Union was identical in belief and tactics and ideology. They didn't differ. They differed only in the sense that Western media uh, represented them differently. But other than Leon Trotsky uh, and Lenin himself, the real the big the guy who was obsessed with destroying the church was Khrushchev. And Khrushchev was the one who developed these, these techniques 
um, that was mirrored roughly around the same. But this was in the in the 70s in in Romania. But it's um, the Romanian case is uh, is is a particularly nasty uh, sort, and it's something that you really can't even talk about on this show because it's too bad. It's too it's too um, it's too gross. The uh, 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 Baku is his name. D U M I T R U B A C U, and it's uh, it's available anywhere. But it is, I have to admit, it's a very, very, very hard book to read because of the the grotesque nature of the experiments that they did on these guys. And uh, I know I think of it eventually. And it's been published. It was published in uh, Somni dot uh, form. The prison was the prison at uh, Pitesti. And I was wrong about the year. It started in 1949. It ended in 1951. Now, I have the feeling that's only just the formal uh, official experiment. I have the feeling it's went on for a long time after that. The, the, the What they did, and if that, some of the stuff is on film for research purposes. Again, the notes were you know, maintained in, in pretty pretty good order. And uh, Khrushchev tried to continue where this left off. And it's a very, very hard book to read. But but Romania, um, pre Ceausescu, created, you know, th- this is the level of obsession that they had. And what always bothered me is that the church, in the Russian case, in the Orthodox case, was always very anti-capitalist. They had successful, more or less Christian socialist experiments. You know, the Brotherhood of the Holy Cross, and you know, the monastery itself, Orthodox is a very monastic religion. And this is a highly communal economy. Well, the monasteries built Europe. They built Eastern and Western Europe. Um, they cleared the fields. They, they cleared the swamps many centuries ago. And so why the Soviets would be so obsessed with destroying what is an anti-capitalist mentality goes, a lot, goes very far to explain what these people really were. Um, the Jewish side of, of communism is, is evident here and that the church was the target. You know, um, as I've said many times, capitalism was never the issue. Labor most certainly was never the issue. They destroyed every pro-labor initiative that existed prior to the revolution and every country they ever came into. But of all religions, orthodoxy had these monastic institutions that were extremely successful while being, you know, in an idealistic Christian sense, as socialist as you could possibly get. So to destroy them, see, it's very, very bizarre. But the church was the enemy. This was a an attempt to create one big factory, as as Lenin would say, you know, where there'd be, there'd be no distinction between agriculture and industry. It would all be one factory. The factory would be installed in the in the fields to not only do mechanized architecture, uh, mechanized agriculture now to some extent. The GMO stuff would have been perfect for these guys. And of course, some of the very early GMO stuff was done under um, Trofim Lysenko in the Soviet Union, um, using various interpretations of Darwin to try to you know create new species. And and they even had a bureau called the um, the Bureau uh, at depending on how you translate the Russian, the Bureau to Replace Nature. And it was very brief under Stalin. And Trofim Lysenko was one of these guys who, a scientist, the official biologist under Stalin, who attempted to create new species. And he was, he was a Lamarckian. And what I mean by Lamarckian is that he believed that acquired characteristics could be passed down, which is heresy as far as Darwinism is concerned. But you could understand why the Soviets would like that kind of thing, because they said, that, well, if we could raise somebody in the Soviet system, then that could actually become part of their genetic code. And this is, this is, you know, just before DNA was discovered. And it could then be passed down. We can actually create a new species of man. And all the, all the great, you know, Marxist and um, the materialist writers always talked about the new man. The French revolutionaries talked about the new man uh, that they were going to create. And it comes from Trofim Marsenko. So the connections here are, are tremendous. But the, the, the connection with the catacomb church was that these were experiments and, and methods that they used to create a new man that didn't need God, didn't want God, because this was some kind of a um, faith in God, was some kind of pathology, was some kind of um, maladaptation to the world around them. And they gave this terrible, you know, pseudoscientific nonsense uh, about it. But today, you know, Trofim Lysenko is someone to get to, to laugh at. Unfortunately, under Stalin, no one was laughing because he was the official biologist and those who differed ended up in prison. So you better follow him 
if you were uh, if you wanted to, to do science in the Soviet Union. So that, that's that's the introduction here, I would say. Okay. Well, the thing that interests me about the Catacomb Church is that the number of martyrs were in the millions, and of course, you know, millions more. Even though uh, they did not, uh, you know, go to the point of death, they basically suffered in the gulags and and under that system in a severe persecution. And there has to be a genuine faith to sustain somebody in that kind of a situation. In other words, uh, if there wasn't a if there wasn't a real and a genuine faith there, you know, they would have just abandoned it and and gone along with whatever program the Soviets wanted them to go along with. And I guess that's what really interests me about the uh, about the whole uh, catacomb church. And we talked about this off air, like I said that. Uh, you know, the Roman Catholic Church has had very few martyrs, and most of the martyrs that they claim weren't Roman Catholic at all. But they stole them from, uh, you know, they stole them from the Anabaptist or from the Orthodox or, or from some other, other group. What was it that, uh, you know, that sustained these people for, uh, you know, to endure the things that they endured? Well, the simple fact that Christ said, you're really not a follower of mine unless the world hates you. The world hated the prophets. The world hates me. It's going to just torture me to death, and it's going to do the same to you. The, the monastic tradition, of course, is an ascetic tradition. And the concept there is our brain, our mind, our mentality affects how we perceive the world. It's not this positivist modern idea that, that the mind is just this stage, and our senses record everything as it is, and, and our mind just, just you know, records it just you know, precisely as we view it and we, we conceptualize it. It's not the case. We see what we want to see. And for somebody who is obsessed with things like profit or sexuality or dominance or anger, they don't see the same world that we do. They see things very differently because the brain is as much productive of what you perceive as, as receptive of what you perceive. So the aesthetic concept is to remove as much of that as humanly possible, to drive self-interest out of this. And what tends to happen is that these guys start viewing the natural order very differently than we do. They stop seeing individual things and they start seeing logos or the essences of things shining through the individual qualities like color and shape and things like that. For most of us, we see a beautiful woman and, and, and we want her. We want to possess her. That's the very nature of sin. No one has ever wanted to possess the concept of a woman. The ascetic idea is to break this connection between your senses and the qualities of objects. You want to see objects as they really are which is as they're created by God with an essence and a purpose, something that extols God, it manifests God's creation. One of the great proofs of God is the tremendous complexity of, of the natural order going right down to the DNA. That's the ascetic and the intense level of self-denial. The purpose isn't to, to suffer pain. The purpose isn't to impress anybody. The purpose is to actually see the world as it is, which is very hard to do. When you remove self-interest, when you break the appetites, things like anger and hunger and everything else, you know, our monks eat very little. Our monks, like for example, on Mount Athos, which is the biggest uh, Orthodox monastic republic, the lifespan is about 98 to 99 years. They eat very little. There's no cancer. There's no heart disease. Um, there is no, there's a hospital there um, on Mount Athos from the universe, uh, State University of Greece of Thessaloniki. No one ever goes there. There's no senility of any kind. Part of the reason is there's no women allowed there, which I have a feeling is a big part of it, but no modern conveniences are there. You, you work, you pray, you do everything you're supposed to do, and you eat very little. No meat or dairy is permitted, and they mostly eat greens and fruits and vegetables and things like that. They don't bathe ever, but they never smell because there's no processed foods. Obviously, there's no obesity or anything like that. And they don't see the world like everyone else. They, the drives that drive us don't exist with these men, especially after decades, it takes a long time to get to this point of view. And that means they see a lot more of the spectrum. You know, we, we, we're, we're capable of picking up maybe a tiny percent of the light spectrum that's out there. You know, we see such a truncated view of reality. But when you break self-interest, when you break your drive to dominate things and to possess things, over a long period of time, you start to perceive more things. The closest you can get to that is little kids. Um, little kids see a lot more than we do. 
they're not focused on making money or being hung up on the reputation or anything else like that. They have, you know, their imaginary friends are very real. We just can't see them anymore because we've grown up. Imaginary friends could be angels. They might be demons too, but they're angels. They could be spirits. We, you know, this is this is who they're talking to. And I'm going to tell you something. We used to do liturgy in my chapel, my church, and the kids always talked about being able to hear the angels singing. They weren't making this up. They're not liars. They're not telling me a story. They could hear it because it was happening. And the most horrible day of my life, they were about 11 or 12, and they couldn't hear the angels singing anymore. That was because they went through puberty. Puberty is the recapitulation of Adam's fall. It's identical. They remove themselves from parents. They're obsessed with their image. They're, they care about clothes. They don't need anybody anymore. The ascetic life, really, the goal is, to, as Christ himself said, to become his little children. Um, this is not an accident. He's not saying to be an idiot or to be, to be immature. He's not saying to be childish, but to be childlike. Adam and Eve weren't perfect. They were innocent. That's why they were naked. They didn't have any kind of drives like that, but the fall created the drive to dominate and to possess, and that was the nature of the temptation that they felt. The ascetic life is to become like little children, but in a rational way. I'm telling you, I've never met an unhappy monk in my entire life, but it's because they don't see the world like we do, because they see God's presence so obviously when we don't. If you love listening to the Dixie Heritage Hour, then I know that you'll love reading The Barnes Review. The Barnes Review is one of my favorite magazines. I began reading The Barnes Review long before they became a sponsor here on the program. In The Barnes Review, you will read vignettes of man from the prehistoric to the very recent, from forgotten races and civilizations to first-person accounts of World War II and the late Cold War. There's just not a more interesting magazine published today, nor a more significant and important subject than real history. So if you'll visit www.barnesreview.org, that's www.barnesreview.org, you can find out how you too can become a subscriber to the Barnes Review. You can subscribe to receive the Barnes Review by mail, or you can subscribe to receive the Barnes Review electronically in PDF editions, or you can subscribe to receive both. That's what I do. So visit www. Dot barnesreview.org and subscribe to the Barnes Review. Right, this is most that, of those that, 60 million that, martyrs weren't monks, though. They were they were factory workers, they were farmers. You know, they were just what we would call ordinary people, but yet they still had right. a faith that would sustain them. You know, rather, you know, they, they would choose the gulag rather than, than giving up their faith or, right. or denouncing it. And so, so what was it that sustained these people? And let me be a little more specific, because I know that before the, before the Soviet uh, era, before the Soviets came to power, that the Russian Orthodox faith had basically permeated all aspects of the Russian culture, and you could say, for example, that Roman Catholicism had permeated every aspect of the culture in other countries of Europe, but yet you did not see, uh, and, and let me give you a good example of this, a lot of the Eastern Bloc countries that the Soviets had conquered, no doubt, you know, were Roman Catholic countries, and you did not see all of these Roman Catholics, uh, you know, choosing the gulag rather than giving up their faith. And so even though... Uh, it was very much a part of the culture. It was something that the Soviets were very eas easily able to do away with, whereas, you know, the Russian Orthodox Christians, they, they didn't go down easily. They, they chose to give their lives. They chose to go to the gulags and so forth. And so, again, what is it that, that caused these factory workers and, and these carpenters and these farmers to basically look right into the face of what might have been the most powerful government of the world at that time, and say, no, send me to the gulag, or no, just, you know, whatever the consequence be, you know, bring it on. All Orthodox people have to follow the monastic rule. And, you know, they fasted, the common people fasted as much as anybody else. You know, during Lent, or the fast before Christmas, you, you couldn't get meat in Russia. You couldn't get your hands on it. 
um, or alcohol or anything like that. So they did lead, lead a very aesthetic life. Now, by the beginning of the 20th century, that was fading. But the aesthetic life and the fact that this is an Eastern, not a Western culture, they didn't see death or pain as necessarily a terrible thing. Because anything that's worth having comes through pain. The, the ascetic life permeated every aspect of the Russian Orthodox world. You didn't have to be a monk for that. The monk was just a, a particularly intense version of it. But they all lived the same life. The household was a small monastery. And the head of the household, and this is the extended family, of course, acted like an abbot. And the services were hours and hours long, you know, uh, especially the old believers, uh, 10, 12 hours a day. The fasts were just as intense. Many of us couldn't do it. So that distinction isn't all that, it isn't all that distinct. Um, now, in Catholic countries, that's not the case. You do have monks in Catholic countries who live very differently than the rest of the population. They have a mar the unmarried priesthood that gets sequestered from the rest of the people. Their, loyal is to, their loyalty is to the papacy, not to their, their parents. The opposite is the case, of course, in, in Orthodox countries. And you know, there's, a man there, there's a monastery in every, every, uh, every region. There were thousands of them. Remember, the largest church in the world at that time was the Church of Rome, uh, just in terms of numbers of parishes and people. The second largest was the church in Russia. And the Soviets had reduced that to a handful of parishes by the time Hitler invaded in 1941. So it was simply the, the understanding of death, the understanding of pain, the understanding that these people had the truth. They knew what the Bolsheviks were, and they went to their deaths in, in huge numbers. Now, don't, you know, let's, let's not exaggerate this. There were plenty of of more weak people who who went along with the program. The so-called Moscow Patriarchate, which still exists today, which went along with the program, although they were unhappy with themselves for doing this. Not everyone could be expected to say, oh yeah, send me to the gulag and torture me to death. Although, as you say, it is shockingly high, the number of people who are willing to do that. When the Soviets took over after the Civil War in 1921, 1922, the church split into three factions. Faction number one, the smallest one, was the bishops under Metropolitan later Patriarch Sergius of Finland, who was put in, in, in head of the church by Stalin. He was to be the, the Soviet spokesman at the World Council of Churches. That's really what his job was. He didn't have much of a, an organization. He essentially was a puppet of, of Stalinism. Then you had the exiles, which were a very large group of people. They left through China and through Eastern Europe, and their headquarters uh, is in, was in New York, eventually in New York City, Our Lady of the Sign Cathedral on 91st Street, and that actually was a fairly large organization. And they kept old Russia alive because they knew that the, the so-called patriarch was a captive, and they didn't condemn him, they felt bad for him, uh, but they told the truth what was going on over there. Then the third was the Catacomb Church. This was a huge organization. The total numbers will probably never be known. These people... Led, led, led a double life. You know, there were factory workers, there were, every, you know, there were peasants, everything else. But later on, when no one was around, they would meet secretly for the services. Patriarch Tikhon, um, who was in and out of prison early on in the revolution, consecrated a huge number of bishops. And the point was, knowing full well that Soviets were going to start killing these guys, he needed as many bishops he could get his hands on to continue the line and consecrate priests and all this stuff to make sure that church existed underground. That was the point of it. There were a number of bishops. I mean, most of the bishops were slaughtered by um, 1930. Most of them condemned uh, Sergius. Most of them gave aid and comfort to those underground. And many of them were successful. The most extreme uh, faction wouldn't even take passports. And sometimes they simply had to, it was easy to bribe some of these guys. It was easy to, it was easy to get by, but they knew that eventually they were gonna get caught. But for the bulk of them, they were just ordinary people that had a, had a double life. Now, they had a full canonical existence. They had synods every once in a while. The first one was in 19, uh, 1922, the so-called traveling synod. Um, and they had an organization. Today, it's all been laid out. It's all been mapped out at the time. Of course, no one knew because even the exiles didn't want to talk about it because they didn't want the Soviets to know about it. Even Alexander Solzhenitsyn comes to America and says, well, there is no such thing as a catacomb church. Well, he knows that that's not true, but he said it just to make, to make sure the Soviets didn't go after them. The small Quisling church, you know, tried to find these guys and, and report them to the authorities, which would mean pretty much death for them. 
the, the Quisling group essentially, you know, they, they traded their life for their dignity. And I, I don't condemn these guys. You know, Sergius was in prison for a while. They took him out and said, if you don't sign this paper saying that we're a wonderful government, we're going to slaughter another 500 priests. It's going to be on you if you don't sign. And he signed. I, don't know, I probably would have done the same thing rather than have that on my conscience. So they knew how to do it. They knew how to – they sent letters in St. Tikhon's name, in the New Martyr's name, uh, saying, well, the Soviets are okay now. You know, they had a whole bureau dedicated to, to fake letters and fake pictures. The Soviets really created the Photoshop ID very early on. Stalin was obsessed with it. Fake bishops trying to be traditionalists, you know. So I read eight. somewhere, and it may have been in your book, that all of the pictures of, of um, Stalin and Lenin were probably uh, doctored in some way. There's a guy, there's an artist named Miles Mathis, who is a good guy. He, he, sometimes he bites off more than he can chew. He's an artist, not a, not a historian, but he does a lot of analysis on these pictures in that era. And it's easy to prove they're fake because it was so crude back then. Some of them are really bad, especially Stalin stuff. The, the, the shades of, of skin don't match. The, the shadows don't match. Even, even the pictures of, of Lenin. If you find a genuine picture of Lenin, he doesn't look anything like the guy that we're used to thinking of. Fake pictures were their stock and trade. Stalin had a whole bureau dedicated to this. So many. I mean, I have a, it's very rare to find a, a genuine picture of Stalin. The, um, so much of it has been painted. The, the so-called um, mugshot picture is as fake as you can get. Most of it is painted anyway. Um, so-called handsome Stalin. You've seen that meme around. That's, that's, not, that's not even him. So, yes, they mastered that, and this is one of the ways that they penetrated these, these other groups. And to this day, these groups are very paranoid. They don't know who to trust even to this day. If anyone knew coming to their organization, they had no idea who it was. It was a brutal life. It was a tough life. But even in the gulags themselves, they had a church structure underground. And every once in a while, you get a couple of guards that were sympathetic. And you had bishops and priests, and they would have a very, very truncated uh, – and, and Solzhenitsyn writes this and his um, – you know, the first circle and, and the cancer ward, and of course in Gulag Archipelago and other uh, in the life of Ivan Denisovich, in some great detail, uh, how this actually functioned within the camps themselves. So even being sent to the Gulag wasn't sufficient to break the religious spirit of these people. And I'm telling you that it's it's the ascetic life, it's the very very different approach to death and pain that Orthodoxy has, and this notion that suffering is is not a bad thing. That's the only way we learn anything is through suffering. You know, people forget our redemption really didn't take you – know, took place mostly in the garden. It was in the garden that the sins, past, present, and future, that ever been committed were dumped on Christ all at once, which is why he, his capillaries burst and he uh, sweat blood. You see this very rarely. Every once in a while, like a, a, a condemned prisoner uh, on his way to be executed will have – will sweat blood. The most extreme levels of stress where your capillaries will burst. That's where our, that's where our um, redemption begins. The cross was the apex of it, but it began in the garden. And Christ had to deal with every negative thing that's ever happened in human history and in the future all at once. And that was the, the cup that he didn't want to have to deal with. His human nature said, please, whatever you can do. And, and it, and it came, came on him. Of course, the apostles were sleeping. And so you know, the cross was nothing compared to what he had experienced in the garden. So – Orthodoxy is, is one of the few of the Christian groups that actually really stresses the garden as the beginning of our redemption because the pain there was far worse than the pain in the cross. The consequences of every negative act dumped on him at once. And of course it couldn't – ultimately it couldn't defeat him because he's not only human but he's also God. And this is what went down into Hades at the time of his, at the time of his death, and he broke those, those gates. The concept of pain is built into the system. At the time, we're suffering, of course, is the most horrible thing ever. But once it's over and we understand what it meant, we realize we couldn't be who we are without pain. No one learns anything without pain. No one does anything without pain. And that's the attitude that you don't see in many other uh, – really in any Western, Western Christian group. You do have a few Catholics who have the old monastic style. You do have some of them in Poland and Hungary and places like that. But only in Orthodoxy do you have this stress on the garden and the sheer – inhuman agony that Christ had to have suffered, given what was dumped on, uh, on him all at once that night. And of course, the apostles couldn't even stay awake. And that really comes out very powerfully in, in Mel Gibson's uh, 
Passion, which is such a wonderful, wonderful film. So I, that, that, that has a lot to do with it. It's a very different conception of death and pain in the East than you have in the West. Extra, extra, read all about it. If you're like me, and I'll bet you are because you're listening to the Dixie Heritage Hour, you like to be on the cutting edge of honest news and accurate information. You like to hear about the latest financial trends and to know what's happening around the world and right here in the United States, the things that can directly impact you, your life, and the life of your family. 26 times a year, the American Free Press newspaper can be delivered to your door, packed with the kind of uncensored news that I know you're going to appreciate. If you're ever dissatisfied with your subscription to the American Free Press, their guarantee is that you just drop them an email and they will gladly refund the unused portion of your subscription. So what are you waiting for? Visit www.americanfreepress.net. Once again, www.americanfreepress.net. And find out about the American Free Press. Do it today. Extra, extra, read all about it. So you talked about how the churches had an order and a structure to them. As far as the actual form of, of worship, shall we say, it would be very difficult, for example, for, for a, a priest, if he's either in a gulag where obviously there is an authority in place that will prevent him from having things that they do not want him to have, or even if you have somebody who is in hiding, in persecution, and they're wandering around Siberia or wandering around in the woods somewhere, you know, just trying not to get caught. Or, you know, they're, they're having their meetings maybe even in the city, but, you know, you have a dozen or so believers who get together, you know, once a week in an apartment somewhere or in, in a barn somewhere where they know that, uh, you know, they feel they have a little bit of privacy. You know, yet you can't be carrying a lot of stuff uh you know, with you to go to these places, you kind of have to do it uh, clandestinely. You know, that would kind of limit the ability to, to have icons or the ability to have things like uh, incense uh, sensors or, you know, obviously, uh, you know, you wouldn't want to wear all of the, uh, the ornate garments that a priest would normally wear because that would be a dead, a dead set off. You know, I would assume that their very form of worship itself became very different and very overly simplistic during that period, or did it not? No, it, it was. I mean, a lot of priests have this stuff memorized, but that, that certainly wasn't the norm. My bishop has told me um, in, in the gulag that he had heard of a liturgy being done with a cracker and a grape. And because you had no, you, you had no possible way of getting anything else— no bishop is going to worry about this. The canonical order was, was, was gone in that sense. But they'll also be the first ones to tell you that what those guys did using those simple little things was far more powerful than what I do every, every Sunday because I don't have that, that suffering uh, uh, every day. So, yeah, the canonical order wasn't there, but it couldn't have been there. Right. The power came from the struggle. The power came from the faith itself, and it, it, it taught you know, the church quite a bit about that. But they certainly weren't condemned for it. This was this was uh, it was it, it was to their to their great credit, they used whatever they could, however they could, and it was granted even a superior status than what it would be like under normal conditions. Well, as you read the New Testament, you do not see the apostle giving us a specific order of service, saying, "Okay, when you meet together, this is what you do. This is the order that you do it in." I mean, even the taking of the Lord's Supper. You know, the apostle told the Corinthians, he said, as often as you take it. But he didn't define how often oft was. And obviously there's a lot of liberty in the, in the scripture. I guess the point that I'm, I'm getting at, though, is, is over the years traditions build. And over the years, what probably started as a very simple expression of faith got added to in ceremony and pomp and circumstance and tradition and so forth. And so now you find the church in persecution in a place like the Soviet Union, and it's back to its most simplest form. And I guess the question is, is did, did orthodoxy have to go through a, a reflection, if you will, on this, as to just how much of the pomp and circumstance not only is perhaps irrelevant, but, you know, maybe even rethinking, you know, why are we, do, why, why are we doing this at all? In other words... Why didn't why didn't orthodoxy stay at that simplistic 
expression of faith after the persecution had ended. I mean, maybe I'm just having a hard time. Hopefully you understand the question I'm asking. Maybe I have, well, I, obviously... I understand. I understand. And I understand Protestants also have a tough time when, when it comes to liturgy. The ancient liturgies of the very earliest church was very complex, and it came from the, uh, the, the temple. Uh, and so in many ways, our, so many of the vestments and everything else came from temple worship. That's, of course, changed uh, to, to reflect the new, the new world that Christ created. The scriptures were put together by the church fathers, who were the, the authoritative uh, interpreters of them. Uh, St. Ignatius of Antioch, who was murdered in 99 AD, the student of St. Peter, who goes to great detail as to what the liturgy was to be. St. Justin Martyr, who died at 101, um, you know, the, the, the word of the apostles was everywhere at the time. Uh, some of these men, Polycarpus is another one, these men knew the apostles. They knew precisely what they were doing. And Justin Martyr explains uh, the substantial nature of the liturgy in, in great detail. So there was never a time there was this primitivism. That comes from the extreme Reformation where they overreacted to the extreme abuses of the Roman church and ended up with nothing. But the, the Bible is a product of the church, not the other way around. And the church fathers um, had all the sacraments, I mean, even going back before the first century, or the turn of the second century, I should say, so 100 AD, had all of the sacraments in place. And the liturgy at a very com fairly complex level, deriving at least indirectly from, from the temple liturgy of the, uh, of the Old Testament. And Christ, of course, and, and was, was educated in the temple. And he taught there uh, when he was teaching the elders. So that's simply, that's, that's just not the case. Uh, liturgy was always, the sacraments were always a part of the church. And the most ancient of the church fathers, before the Bible was even put together, spoke of this in great detail. And really the main, the main part of the liturgy is the Psalms. The Psalms overwhelmingly dominate, especially the monastic liturgy. And they usually go through, sometimes they go through the entire Psalter in a day. Normal people take a week. The Psalms, the Old Testament, and of course the scripture readings, uh, sorry, the temple and the scripture readings really are the core of it. And that really was, was what the early fathers uh, were talking about. Now they had individual books of the Bible. And it's one of our pieces of evidence of the Bible is certainly before the, the first century because it, they're, they're referencing it. You know, Polycarpus references it. Uh, Ignatius of Antioch references it before he was killed in 99, um, 98. So, but he does explain the liturgy in great detail. And he was, of course, from Antioch, which is one of the richest cities of the Roman Empire. And they, they still had the old the tradition there, uh, although done in Greek. So, um, so that was always the case. So that's not something that developed. Um, the Russians certainly made it a bit longer, but that was just you know, adding psalms and things like that. But there was never a time where it was just kind of this primitive, that's, that's a fantasy, that, that never existed. And of course, the psalms were absolutely dominant in all forms of prayer. Most of our saints have them memorized. I guess the one thing that developed is the methods of chanting did develop over time. Uh, methods of chanting, the, the tones and the, and, the, and the modes and the octaves and stuff like that, the musical part of it did, did develop, that's for sure. But there was always, the liturgy was always there and always fairly complex. But, but I understand your point. It did show that while this is wonderful and it's an educational thing, it's a, you know, essentially going through Christ's life and the life of the church was something what the liturgy is. If, if you go through it over the course of a, of a day, let alone a year, that's what the liturgy is. It's, it's the acting out of, of Christ's life and the life of the church and the life of creation. If you know how to read the symbols, which already people know how to do, that's what it is. But without any of that, uh, you were reduced to the absolute core of it all. It's no way, you know, you, you don't want everyone to be like that because the, the liturgy has such a tremendous uh, pedagogical and educational function. Uh, that's how the church speaks to people and how it always has. But it did, it was a very powerful thing to say that you can't take it for granted anymore. That fear of death that was transformed into uh, love is what made the martyrs martyrs. And so that did have a very powerful impact. But it just shows you that, that the fear was transformed into love. And some of these guys, when the nuns are, several cases where the nuns went singing to their deaths, um, almost happy to be meeting God very soon. The women had a tendency to be more pleased with death, the idea that they're gonna be seeing God and they went to their death singing quite often and they converted a lot of people in the process. As I've looked at the, the Orthodox liturgy, and let me say, what as I've studied the Roman Catholic 
mass and, and you know how it breaks down and so forth. I don't see the gospel there. I, I, I see something that is is similar to but isn't quite the gospel there. But I don't see the gospel there. As, as I look at the Orthodox, uh, like the divine liturgy and so forth, as I as I break it down, as I've studied it, and, and I know I've not studied it to the extent that you have, I can still see the gospel there. It's 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 very I don't want to say clouded, but you know, it's it's entrapped with a lot of stuff around it, but it's there. But when they started the Moscow Patriarch, was the gospel still in their liturgy or was it completely lost there? No, I mean, the, the actual liturgy on Sundays, Saturday night Sundays, um, has the, uh, the, gospel, the gospel reading from the, the letters of St. Paul, then the gospel itself, as really the high point of everything. Um, that never went away. That actually has a cycle. So, so I, even the Soviet ordained priests were still essentially yeah. putting the gospel out every week, whether they realized it or not. No, they realized it. I mean, I think a lot of these guys thought that they were doing a good thing. They figured, well, we're not ready to die quite yet, but maybe in this truncated form, we could still do some good to these people. And the Moscow Patriarch, believe it or not, created a lot of good people. Uh, for some people, it was the only game in town. They were at least permitted a certain level of freedom to do the full level of services. And that themselves created a whole lot of, uh, but, you know, um, the stuff that you're talking about, that's education. That would be like a, a sermon. This is from ancient sources. When the church fathers who put the Bible together referred to scripture, they're not just referring to the books of the Bible. They're referring to all of the, the ancient writings um, having to do with, with the church, whether it be the monastic rules or the canons, including the canons of the apostles. That, um, that govern the church to this day. The North Carolina Heritage Political Action Committee was organized by concerned citizens of North Carolina in 2015 in response to the increased attacks on North Carolina's history and heritage. The North Carolina Heritage PAC supports state and local candidates for public office who pledge and show their support for the protection of Confederate memorials and the preservation of all of North Carolina's history. We all know that Confederate memorials and symbols are the easy targets and that the end game of our leftist enemies is to erase and rewrite all of history, from the colonies to the war on terror. If we fight them for our state's rich Confederate history and heritage, we may be able to stop them from their mission of total destruction. Join the North Carolina Heritage Pact now by visiting ncheritagepact.org. Once again, that is www ncheritagepac.org and help us on the front lines of North Carolina politics. The mission statement of North Carolina Heritage Pack is that the North Carolina Heritage Pack was created with the purpose of supporting diverse efforts to defend and preserve the heritage, traditions, monuments, cemeteries, flags, emblems, and other legacies of North Carolina history against those efforts to remove, deface, legislate against, alter, and otherwise corrupt or pervert their meaning, history, presentation, and standing in our state. Once again, www.ncheritagepac.org. One of the things that, that I've noticed in what little bit of reading I have done of, you know, actual testimonies of people who were involved in the catacomb churches of Russia during the Soviet era is priests and bishops that were basically traveling through Siberia, literally talking about how the Holy Spirit would tell them to go here, or the Holy Spirit would tell them to go there, or they were having a meeting somewhere and the Holy Spirit would tell the priest to tell everybody that we need to leave and we need to go here right now, and literally no sooner than they had vacated the building that they were in that there were soldiers or police or KGB or somebody who had come to that place trying to find them and they had just evaded yes. capture. You know, obviously these were a group of people who who were very sensitive to the Holy Spirit that was within them. In other words, they, they weren't being sustained at this point by the symbols of their religion, but by the Holy Spirit himself. In the West, because of nominalism and positivism, uh, symbol is something you could get, you know, oh, oh it's just symbolic. That's not the, the root of the word. We use the word symbol very, very differently. 
than what the Greeks would, would do. They maintained the liturgy. They believed in it firmly. But yes, you're absolutely right. They were always on the move. They were always traveling. There were many, many miracles like that. It happened all the time that these men, again, that's the ascetic life. And now the ascetic life has just been tripled because they're looking death in the face every single day. And not just death, but a horrible death. And so that just intensifies everything else. Fasting doesn't seem like anything compared to what these guys are, are, are you know, may, may well experience. Um, but, you know, not everyone was destined to be murdered. The church had to be, had to continue, and it did. You had tens of millions in the catacomb church that continued to function, and of course in the 90s came to the surface. And they were always, they're very jealous of their independence, they're very decentralized, uh, a bit eccentric. But of all the people who were dedicated to the liturgy, these guys would be the most intense. That's because they couldn't take it for granted. Now they're free, and there's people even starting to take it for granted now because it's, it's the day to day. But when you could be taken away from you at any moment, you never took it for granted. And that's what created a very, very different type of personality that in this world would be considered crazy, but in the Christian world is nothing but the, the highest level of virtue. And I ask myself all the time, if I were there, what would I do? I think most of our people would be the first ones to go up and down Red Square with the red flag, you know, just to keep ourselves from having our, you know, skin torn off like it did to uh, uh, Metropolitan uh, Peter of Kutitsa. They used to force him to kneel on frozen metal and have him stand up, and his skin would just be left on the, on the metal. It was a particular, you know, they had those creative guys, you know, these, these people, uh, to get him to give in. He never gave in. But not everyone could be expected to do that. But St. Peter did it, and he died of his wounds eventually in the 30s. But you know, they tortured him to death, and he wouldn't give in. That's, that's a special grace that was what you're talking about here that under normal circumstances you're not going to find. So maybe if I was there, I would get that same infusion of grace that we couldn't, couldn't expect today but would exist back then. And I think that these guys were in a perpetual state of high adrenaline and you know, fight or flight. Uh, and you mix that with grace and the services that they had and the fact that they're look, looking death in the face every single day, every minute of every day, it creates a very different personality, making closer to, to the catacomb church in the ancient world than the day-to-day -day church of today. We take it all for granted because it's so normal. You know, we're free to do this stuff. And I think that's a lot of what you're talking about. And the spirit, they could hear this stuff. They're closer to, to God in that case than we would be. I had read something recently that Vladimir Putin's mother worshipped in one of the catacomb churches and uh, Putin himself was baptized by a catacomb priest as a young man and lived secretly as a Christian throughout uh, the Soviet era. That was me. I, I published that uh, article. Uh, it existed in Russian for a long time. You know, I had I kind of cobbled together uh, pieces from the different different Russian sources on that respect. But yes, his mother was a secret Christian. Uh, Vladimir baptized at a young age, and he was always um, a very pro-Christian. But it was hard to do when you're you know a policeman. But his work in East Germany, he was a you know self-defense instructor. You know, I tell people that. The only place that, that Leninism and Marxism was ever taken seriously was in American universities. It was not taken seriously in the Soviet Union, especially in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. It, it wasn't taken seriously there. These guys went into the army or the security services because they were nationalists. They saw the Soviet Union not as a, a communist experiment, but as a manifestation of the Russian Empire. And you know, there's a lot of wishful thinking in that respect, but they created this Soviet patriot idea rather than some internationalist Marxist idea. These guys didn't go into the army because they couldn't wait to defend Jewish Marxism. That's nonsense. They went into the army because they were patriots. And they had to take the required courses in Marxism, and they, they laughed at it. The last thing these guys were internationalists. And the proof of that is that when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, the Communist Party, uh, led by Gennady Zugano, became one of the most right-wing parties in the world. If you read Communist Party stuff, the CPSU stuff today, I might as well have been writing that stuff. Now their real feelings about the world can now be freely um, laid out. These people are nationalists. They're Eurasianists. They have tons of, of, of Christian stuff now. It was just under that regime, they had to behave in a certain way. Now they're able to, you know, freely um, write what they mean. The Communist Party is today is, is a, is a right-wing organization.
And it's very bizarre to hear this nationalist stuff with a hammer and sickle on top of it. But that's Russia. And you have to actually know how to look past that stuff and see the truth within it. Um, unfortunately, they do see some of them. Putin is not one of these people, but they do see Stalin as a nationalist, which is an error. But there's a whole mythology about him that he resurrected the church and he was a Russian nationalist and all that stuff. It isn't true, but it was a useful myth to get away from Marxism and to kind of transform the Soviet Union into some Russian national state. Again, wishful thinking, but that's what happens when you live in an oppressive system. Um, so you write about Putin, and uh, um, I don't know in English who else has done that. I I'm pretty sure it's out there. Um, but I got my article from Russian sources over the years and put it together. It's on my website. I did a broadcast on it. It's been re republished in a million places. So, so yeah, I'm pretty sure you saw my, my thing. And also, you've mentioned a few different times the old believers. And I encountered some of the old believers when I was uh, pastoring in Alaska many years ago. But tell us briefly uh, exactly who the old believers are and how they came to be referred to as the old believers. I have a book out on the old believers. I've been very sympathetic to them. Um, the old believers came into existence as a rebellion against the liturgical reforms, so to speak, that began the synod in 1666-67 in old Russia. Greek liturgy that came out of Greek-speaking Italy that was used to remake the Russian liturgy. It had more to do with the centralization of the state and the creation of an empire, which found its apogee in Peter the Great, who was a very secular man, was a Gnostic, was an occultist. The old believers withdrew from that state. They extolled the old Russian empire under Moscow, but when Moscow was abandoned for St. Petersburg under Peter, they withdrew from Russian society and created their own um, world. Their liturgy is their only focus. They do the old um, monastic liturgy from the Muscovite Empire. I have all their books here. It's really impossible to do because it goes on for hours and hours and hours. You go through the Psalter every day, endless. Uh, I mean, you go through almost the entire New Testament in, in, in a week. Um, it's, uh, it's very, very intense. But foreign visitors to the old Muscovite Empire prior to Peter the Great just say that you can't, no one could stand for this long. They never had pews, of course, and yet they could stand for, you know, 16 hours on a typical Sunday. That's what the old believers had maintained. And so it really, in my opinion, was a rejection of Peter the Great and his secularizing reforms uh, of Russia, bringing in foreigners, so in introducing capitalism, introducing uh, the occult. The Russian society and a new aristocracy that he created that was mostly foreign that took over the country in the 18th century. The old believers were firm, solid Russian nationalists, and they firmly believe that it was the Moscow church prior to the 17th century that the true faith is to be found. And I have a tendency to agree with them. And I've translated a lot of their stuff, and they are um, they're the healthiest thing that Russia has probably ever produced. By the 19th century, most peasants were old believers. It was about 20 or 30 million people. Of course, they were crushed. Many of them like, you know, went to Alaska. Many went to Turkey. The Cossacks are almost all old believers at this point. There's a huge organization in Austria, and they're all over the place. So they were essentially catacomb Christians centuries before the Soviets took over. But I've argued for a long time that Peter the Great was a precursor to the Soviet Union, did persecute the, the ancient faith to a great extent. He just didn't have the, the state that, that, that Lenin had. He didn't have modern technology that Lenin had. So he focused himself just on creating a new aristocracy and a new vision for Russia. That was, itself was overthrown, it's true. It didn't last that long, but it left a great scar on Russia. And the old believers were the result. And they maintained the ancient tradition when no one else was. And the old believers are an extraordinary group of people and are probably the strictest Christians you'll ever find and are the closest to the ancient church that we could ever uh, get to. But the liturgy is so intense and so long, it's their entire life is based around the liturgy. Everything they do from the minute they wake up to the minute they go to sleep is has some liturgical significance. They're almost Amish in their view of things. Uh, well, that's what I was going to ask you. Are they the Russian Orthodox version of the Amish? In many ways. I mean, I've heard that many times. To some extent, yeah. Yeah, it, it's, a, yeah uh, it's, you know, of course, theology is completely different. I live in Amish country here. The theology is different, but yeah, they have a lot in common. It's very true.
In your book, The Soviet Experiment, you had alluded to the possibility that perhaps we are in a far worse form of persecution today than what our Soviet counterparts in the Orthodox Church underwent during the Soviet era. However, we just don't know it. Could you kind of explain that a little bit? You don't need gulags when you have a television. The gulags were very crude. TV and media and music, that's very sophisticated. But the purpose is the same. Capitalism is just better at it. And we have, you know, modern psychology and everything else knows how to manipulate people, knows how to go right into the, the mind of a man and find his weaknesses and play on that. You know, Lenin didn't have that. Capitalism does. The whole new school for social research and advertising and marketing, the whole concept is to manipulate people, to get them to buy things that they really don't need. That's what it's based on. That's what the so-called market is. Uh, when, I, when it's dominated by these huge conglomerates that, of course, the founding fathers didn't recognize, didn't understand. Adam Smith condemned without question. It's not even, you know, capitalism is a rule of capital. It's not a good thing. It's a negative thing. The market is another map. The free market is different, but the free market is gone. These are huge conglomerates and huge banks. They don't respond to the market. They create the market. So it's no different than the Soviet Union. It's both. It's a planned economy either way. In the bureaucracy, whether you deal with the bureaucracy at AT&T or at a government agency, it's the same damn thing. It doesn't matter the nature of it. The bureaucracy is bureaucracy. It's the same thing. Power is power. We can't be a part of this world at all. We have to cut ourselves off as much as humanly possible. And whatever interaction we have, we have to be very well aware that we're in dangerous territory. And this is why saturating ourselves with the liturgy, surrounding ourselves with the icons and the holy books and the music and everything else, and constantly reading with this is what preserves us. When you're dealing with, with a regime that's very psychologically nuanced, they know how to prey on weaknesses. That's what the whole marketing concept is all about. It's just less overtly painful than the gulag, but the concept is exactly the same and the purpose is exactly the same. Okay. Because the battle of the, of the catacomb church is still with us today. Just capitalism is oppressive in a slightly different way than the communists were. It's more nuanced, it's more psychological, but I think more effective. The battle is exactly the same. We live in a factory that produces sin. It's like being an alcoholic and being forced to work in a bar. That's why I read these guys. I read these guys almost every day in my life because, you know, if they could do it, so can I. And yeah, the oppression that we suffer isn't this direct physical oppression, but it's deeply psychological and manipulative in a far more intense way than the physical. You know, a state that, that's violently oppressive, has a machine gun nest in every roof, they, that's, not, that's not sustainable. That can't last. People are going to rebel against that. But when you can get inside their heads and alter the very definition of the words that they use, uh, alter the nature of, of an argument, what an extremist is or, or what good is, what, what real is, that's the sort of control that Lenin wishes he had. But in, in capitalist countries, psychology, pornography, all this stuff, has, has you know, the, the celebrity culture has created a totally different man that would be considered, you'll know, be put in an asylum 100 years ago. And so it's the same battle, it's the same fight, it's against the same people, and it calls for the same response. But because it's a golden cage other than an iron cage, people don't see it as a cage. And that's, that's our biggest problem. I'm going to cut it there because we are out of time for this week's TBR Radio Presents the Dixie Heritage Hour. Dr. Johnson and I's con conversation did continue for probably about another three or four minutes and basically what he discussed during that time was that he was brought to the faith and discipled in the Orthodox faith by Russian believers who had found exile in the United States, most of them coming to the United States during the 80s to escape the Soviet persecution. Russian believers who had escaped the gulags, who had escaped the camps. And he talks about what it was like to be befriended by them, to be uh, taken into their communities, and to be discipled by them in the faith and so forth. And he also talked about um, how one of them is still alive today and how he's still very much in the conversation and fellowship with her and what a delightful saint in the Lord that she is. But we are, as I said, out of time. I would like to encourage you to go to uh, Dr. Johnson's Russ Journal website. Some very great, interesting articles there.
Also go to my website, www.dixieheritage.net. So from all of us here at Dixie Heritage, until next week, God bless. <music>